Welcome to the CIO Evolution. In this podcast, we'll explore the Chief Information Officer's role in executing a new ongoing leadership imperative, digital transformation that promotes agility and resilience. How do CIOs upgrade legacy networks? What are the financial challenges CIOs face? And what are the security measures that are required in the new work from anywhere, mobile and cloud-based world? Welcome to another episode. Today we have Akshay Grover, the Global Equity Practice Lead at Zscaler. A fun fact, he and I started working at Zscaler the same week, just over two years ago. Akshay, welcome to the show. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for having me. Today, we will look at private equity, your specialization. So we know that deal makers have their work cut out in this economy, right? It's quite uncertain where things are going. And it drives a wedge between buyer and seller expectations. But big deals are being announced again, and the industry is entering a new era that will favor owners willing to improve operations at the companies that they have bought. A key focus is on carve-outs and public-to-private investments. Akshay, can you set the stage in terms of the overall trends and issues facing the industry today? Absolutely, Chris. Uh, PE is a topic that's uh, near and dear to me as I've spent over 20 plus years of my career advising PE firms and working alongside them. To set the stage for our listeners, I think many people are familiar with um, mergers, acquisitions, and carve-outs. And when they think of these uh, motions that corporations make, they tend to think of um, um, acquiring one company, acquiring another company. That is like Salesforce making an acquisition of the Tableau or MuleSoft or um, you know Disney making an acquisition of 21st Century Fox. All of those deals, are corporate deals and corporate to corporate deals. And they represent about 50 to 60% of the total M&A deals that happen in the market. And the remaining number of transactions, if you think about the other 40 to 50% of transactions are led by private equity firms. So it may not come as a surprise to you, but unlike corporate buyers, which tend to hold the acquisition, and integrate those acquisitions. PE bag transactions, they usually have a three to five to seven year horizon. It's called mm-hmm. their hold period. And the PE firms, along with their operating partners, have a mandate to improve and enhance the value of their portfolio companies during that holding period. And um, they eventually exit that investment either uh, through a sale to another PE firm. Uh, a sale to a strategic buyer, which is again, a corporate buyer or an IPO. So having said that, in terms of the issues that are facing the industry today, as you can probably imagine in this economy, the value creation as well as value preservation is of utmost importance. It's no different than any other business. These PE firms and their portfolio companies are also dealing with cybersecurity challenges like everyone else. And we all know that cybersecurity is a, a value destroyer, right? Like if you're hit by a ransomware attack or if you're hit by an attack, it's it's going to be really challenging to come back on and stand back on your feet. And that's the reason that cyber resiliency is that important. Lastly, I would say that as a PE firm or an operating partner in this climate, you have to think of strategies to protect your assets and prevent value erosion, like a security breach, as I mentioned. And the good news is we are seeing a lot of progressive PE firms take a stance on cyber, and they have taken steps to improve the cyber posture of their firms and their portfolio companies. And we can dive into it um, throughout this session. And uh, this is a topic that we we talk on a daily basis with all of our PE partners. Thanks for setting the stage. And I definitely want to know later in this discussion, like what separates those PE firms that are progressive in this manner and those who may not be, right? Because you think everybody would want to leap forward, but it's not always the case. But let's talk about the strategies. So what strategies can private equity funds use to raise profitability if they cannot buy assets cheaply? And why have they been a sideshow for many firms during the past decade? Well, Chris, you ask all the difficult questions. And this one is a loaded question as well. Undoubtedly, the assets 
are no longer cheap. And you can argue they can still get good, de good deals due to decrease in valuations of many private and public companies. Having said that, PE firms have always taken a very methodical approach to value creation. And I'd say that it was never a sideshow. Uh, if we go back 20 to 30 years, majority of the PE firms were buying distressed assets. And what I meant by that was you know, distressed assets with um, uh, debt that was um, financed at a higher interest rate. And those PE firms were coming in and they were refinancing the debt, uh, also known as financial reengineering applying that arbitrage to get that value out of the asset an immediate value out of the asset. <laughs> then they turned to outsourcing, you know, a lot of other strategies. Uh, then there was labor arbitrage uh, that they were doing through outsourcing. And um, then they ventured into a lot of these procurement based value creation, wherein group buying scenarios and leveraging their purchasing power, et cetera. So, so this has always been the case with private equity firms that they adopted multiple strategies to create value from all of those aspects that I just mentioned. And now, if you look at it, um, these were popular uh, in the heydays and, and definitely were working well. But now when you look at it, fast forwarding to today, you know, you know that capital is not, no longer cheaper. And within rising interest rates and over the years, B firms have evolved and adopted several value creation levers, which include leveraging technology to optimize operations. And most fee firms have dedicated teams today that are focused on digital transformation. And they're looking at all aspects of the technology in their portfolio company. And since the last three to five years with the increase in cyber attacks and cyber attacks have always been around, Chris, I mean, they, they haven't um, gone away, but as you know, right? Like there has been a surge in the last, I would say five years, especially, Businesses are hurting and PE backed businesses who, who lacked controls are hurting and, and all the PE firms are now gearing up to, to protect that those assets that they have built and cyber has become taken a center stage in, in the PE industry right now. Right. So there's an evolution, if you will, of where the the benefit and the value can be extracted along this this curve, right? for the PE industry. And it sounds like shared services for procurement and IT was one such area. And now that has been more or less exhausted. Yeah, that that has uh, that has exhausted. I think and there is always a tipping point for everything, right? So um, yeah, they, when they initiated it, they saw some immediate gains, but also the labor arbitrage numbers have gotten um, a bit squeezed in these days. Um, as um, you know, low cost countries, the wage inflation has happened in those areas as well. So now I think uh, they're looking at new value creation opportunities. And the uh, and the good news is that the technology has evolved. You know, we talked about generative AI. We talk about uh, different um, you know self uh, service tools that talk about advancement and customer relationship management. Where we talk about advancement in cyber technologies to prevent, detect, and uh, respond to attacks. So there is a lot of technological innovation that is happening today in the industry that is really feeding the new value creation opportunities in these private equity firms and their portfolio companies. I mean, what applies to all applies to them just in very specific ways that we'll get into in a moment. Some listeners may be scratching their heads saying, hey, wait a minute, I've heard some of this before on an M&A episode that we had. And it's true. We had Stephen Singh, Global VP, M&A divestiture and ITO from Zscaler on the show last September. There we covered how IT leaders and corporate strategists can harness the cloud and digital transformation to accelerate the tech side of integrations. But now we're talking about PE. So what are some of the similarities and differences given that PE is more or less a subset of this M&A field? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point, Chris. And I would just elaborate on what you just said. Yes, M and A and divestitures are somewhat um, a constant in the PE world, right? Like they continue to acquire companies, they continue to have companies that they want to have them as of their portfolio companies eventually. So they are constantly on the lookout for deals, right? So M and A is a constant for them, but um, there is a different spin to that. 
Um, in a corporate to corporate M&A situation or corporate divestiture situation, it's um, it's it's a different kind of motion altogether. So let me just uh, break it down for you, which would allow you to and the listeners to learn more about different transaction archetypes. So P firms engage in three different kind of transactions. One is um, called a standard buyout or you can say that as a platform acquisition. And what it means is that this is the most popular as PE firms are buying an asset with plans to complement that asset with adjacency acquisitions. Um, so that's kind of the standard buyout. The second is um, when as more and more corporate businesses uh, are divesting non-core assets, those are very attractive to the PE buyers because what they could do with that asset is, um, and what's non-core for a corporate could be could become like a really good business for a PE buyer. And they can carve out that business, they can stand up that business into an independent company, um, uh, expand the business uh, business areas uh, and, and revenue areas of that company. And then that's a carve out acquisition that they, they do typically. Um, for example, I'll just share with you recently, I was reading uh, the news on Baxter and Baxter recently announced the divestiture of its biopharma business mm -hmm. to a consortium uh, led by Warburg Pincus and Advent International. These are two large private equity firms. And um, some of the uh, other corporate buy, cor corporate uh, companies are looking to divest other businesses as well. So, and the third category is around add-on acquisition. And add-on acquisition, as I meant uh, and laid out, it, it links back to that standard buyout. This goes hand in hand with the platform acquisition that I described. So you buy an asset, and then you buy like companies that complement that asset, you integrate them together, make it a bigger company, make it a more attractive company, make it a more diverse company in terms of revenue streams, uh, make it a more um, operationally uh, well-run company. And that's that's what the goal of an add-on acquisition is. Those three archetypes, um, those, are, those are really, really powerful uh, strategies that PE firms adopt. Thanks for walking us through the three archetypes, but can you... Talk about where the overlap is among them. Yeah, uh, definitely. And I was going to get um, going on that as well. So if you think about it, the area that we see significant overlap between PE firms and corporate firms is M&A is in the add-on acquisition archetype. Okay. So oftentimes these PE firms are looking to scale rapidly. And um, as we talked about the holding period, it's five to seven years. And sometimes it can shrink to three to five years. So they are looking to scale rapidly. And uh, the ability to quickly add on and integrate new acquisitions is of strategic importance to these firms. And Zscaler, as you know, can enable, and this is what was covered in the previous episode that you described, can enable the rapid connectivity of both organizations without having to integrate the networks. Um, and that is very powerful for the PE firms. And, and as, as they do add-on acquisitions, um, as they deploy a Zscaler for cyber resiliency, Zscaler becomes more and more strategic for these firms and that allows them to scale rapidly and, 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 um, and drive um, growth um, as they expect to do uh, post-close. Uh, post um, the other piece that I do want to mention to you, Chris, is that not only add on acquisitions, um, and we are also able to help the PE firms in the other two archetypes. If you think about it, you know, one is uh, the stand standard buyout. So when they acquire a company, and there is always a notion of, am I buying a breach? Do I know mm -hmm. enough about their security posture? And you do diligence for that, and you definitely put all your resources at, at, to bear and learn more about the company pre-deal. But it's um, it's somewhat surprising, but everyone finds out something after the fact as well. So that what you do with that is where we come in. We are able to elevate the security posture of the portfolio company um, by providing a baseline set of controls uh, for traffic and users that are traversing out to the open internet. Uh, we provide a full proxy architecture that secures the user's traffic going out to the internet with full inline inspection of SSL um, and provide data loss prevention capabilities. And we help eliminate the need for traditional SWIG appliances. Further, we help accelerate their zero trust journey 
because ultimately we are going to be able to help them replace their VPN and a lot of other uh, appliance-based security solutions that they have and uh, assist them with future-proofing the, the asset from, from a technology and security standpoint. And, um, uh, and finally, consolidating the point products and driving cyber resiliency. So I said a lot, but overall, if you think about it, across those three archetypes, there's a standard buyout, whether it's a carve-out acquisition, whether it's an add-on acquisition, we have something to offer in each of those transaction types. Thank you. The, the PE firms manage large disparate networks, regardless of what archetype, right? I guess it could there could be a, a wide range of portfolio companies and continually transact on both the sell side and buy side. So what are the considerations for the overall cyber risk mitigation across all the constituents, meaning the, the PE firms, the transactions, and the portfolio companies? Hey, Chris, you're absolutely right. Uh, PE firms, portfolio companies can range from um, anywhere between like 10 on the lower end to 200 plus on the higher end. Um, so it's a pretty wide range, first of all. It's uh, it's also important to highlight that no matter the size of the portfolio company or the industry they operate in, cyber risks present significant exposure to all portfolio companies as, as it relates to things like financial loss. Uh, you can talk about reputational loss and regulatory or compliance exposure. So it's a, it's a pretty... Um, uh, you know, serious thing to for private equity firms to take care of. So when it comes to risk mitigation, whether it's at a firm level or a portco level, or even during a transaction, it's important to think about things like, what are you trying to protect? That is your crown jewels. Um, whom are you trying to protect it from? That is, where do you see the threats arising? Um, what's the cost to implement the controls? And how do we optimize these costs? And remember, there is no such thing as a one-size-fits-all approach. Uh, and I also think it's really important to consider things like proper cyber governance and control and um, think about aspects like, does the PE firm or portfolio company have security expertise um, on the board or at least in an advisory capacity? Has the PE firm or portco adopted a security framework like CIS, a Center for Internet Security, or NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology, uh, whereby they have actually mapped their controls against the standard to assess its completeness and robustness? And lastly, are they thinking about approaches like zero trust to help protect their most valuable assets? And, and I don't have to describe it and put a plug in here right. about Zscaler. We stand for zero trust architecture and, uh, and, and a cloud native zero trust architecture, which is, yep. which is very powerful and useful for PE firms and their portfolio companies. So Akshay, we're going to talk about the board of directors and their approach to, to cybersecurity across these firms. But going back to what you said about security expertise on the board, in your experience, have you witnessed like former CISOs or former chief security officers as board members? Absolutely. So as you know, there's a shortage of um, uh, cybersecurity professionals uh, and uh, that's a good thing, <laughs> first of all. Because um, that uh, that keeps us um, keeps us uh, engaged and uh, employed. Um, but uh, if I look back in terms of where the board was originally and how they were structured, now even there is a mandate that is coming uh, from um, there is a body which is um, board of directors and also SEC. Um, so there are like different organizations that are coming up with different set of requirements, by the way. So, um, and, um, and what they are saying is that we do need to have a, a board member who needs to have some kind of background in cybersecurity. So uh, similar to the diversity initiatives on the board, which are very powerful, this, it's, this is also a pretty welcome approach that we are seeing from a lot of public companies. And um, it takes time to percolate into the privately uh, owned companies, which is where the PE backed companies fall into. But if you look at it from uh, the preparation perspective, and I think you you picked up on my word progressive PE firms, um, progressive PE firms, they are deploying uh, dedicated and discrete resources who are going to be managing portco wide cyber resiliency. 
And their, their job description is such that, that they cover entire portfolio of mm -hmm. uh, the, the ownership across the ownership life cycle of the, of the PE firm. Um, and then they have a direct responsibility and a direct line to the board. They present the portfolio-wide risks uh, to the board and whether today the PE firms are deploying cyber expertise on the board or not, but they are following the pub their public um, uh, company brethren and uh, eventually they're going to get there, but they're taking active measures to deploy an expertise that would oversee the portco-wide uh, cyber resiliency frameworks and how they are looking at uh, uh, installing controls across their portfolio companies, for sure. Yeah, it sounds like we're marching toward a world where there's an equivalent to, say, Sarbanes-Oxley, but for cyber and breaches, right? Yep. So we were going to talk a little bit more about what Zscaler does specifically to help with these challenges before, before we went off on that tangent. Do you want to briefly cover that before we get into the board of directors? Um, so what I was going to share with you was um, um, about Zscaler a little bit, um, you know, so at Zscaler, as I mentioned, um, we have the, we have had the privilege of serving some of the largest PE firms in the world. You know, six out of the top 10 PE firms today are Zscaler customers. And um, hundreds and hundreds of their portfolio companies across the board are our customers as well. And um, and the reason that we uh, hear words like game changer and uh, greatest things in sliced bread is because we are helping companies achieve true zero trust through our platform approach and offering the capabilities that they need to keep their portfolio companies and their assets secure. Um, we are able to elevate the cyber posture as we discussed we are uh, able to instill cyber resiliency uh, at the portco level. And what we have seen among our PE customers and their portcos is when the leverage of our platform is that they're able to dramatically reduce cyber threats by 80 to 85%. And uh, optimization of security spend, which is, which is a big deal because the proliferation of the tools, Chris, as you may know, and our listeners may also appreciate has happened so much over the last two decades or three decades that um, companies are struggling to really make sense out of the their security stack today. And uh, with the adoption of a platform approach, we are able to bring down that security spend um, by 30 to, 30 to 40%. And last but not the least, I mean, the ultimate North Star is for each and every portfolio company to get to uh, a zero trust approach uh, towards their cyber resiliency. And we, there's no other company that could get them faster there than Zscaler. And some listeners may recall a previous episode with uh, Mike Murphy over at, on the business value assessment team who could bring even more quantified metrics to everything that you just shared, uh, which is something that Zscaler provides customers. Now we could finally get into a topic I'm definitely interested in as well, uh, the board of directors, since cyber risk, as you we all know, is now business risk. But some of the questions that come up, uh, I'm sure at PE firms, from the board of directors to CISOs and technology leads are, are like, how are we responding to regulatory changes, You know, such as the proposed SEC 4A ruling on breach disclosure, or is our cybersecurity investment enough? And what have you seen work in teams of leaders effectively answering these questions, Akshay? It's a definitely a, a question that um, uh, requires a lot of um, a lot of elaboration because um, it's a it's a bit of a complicated topic. And um, I would first like to diffuse this um, this entire ruling, like the proposed ruling, what that means. I'd like to elaborate a bit on that first, um, and then we can get into some of the other parts of your question as well. Mm -hmm. um, I promise I'll address all of those. <laughs> so um, it, it's uh, from a breach disclosure that SEC has proposed um, and their applicability to private funds. So, so most of these rulings, as you know, SEC is a governing body and it um, governs mostly public companies. 
And um, so, so there is most of those rulings are applicable to the public companies. But what's different this time is that uh, they are extending the cybersecurity breach disclosure ruling to companies backed by private equity firms as well. You know, and uh, the way that it is laid out is that under the leadership of the SEC chair, um, the commission voted on February 9th, I think that was last year uh, in 2022, to propose a new set of rules. And this time, the rules were aimed at registered investment companies, registered investment advisors, and business development companies or funds that would require concrete cybersecurity policies and procedures that would essentially bring the segment of the financial industry more in line with the, the, the other areas. The, the new rules would also demand that advisors report to the SEC cybersecurity incidents that impact themselves, the firm or fund or their clients. So now you can, you can read between the lines that it's a pretty complicated um, uh, uh, ruling and it would take a lot to unpack this because they're talking about multiple stakeholders in here, right? Like registered investment mm -hmm. advisors, funds, uh, privately backed companies. And then the catchy part here is as to that you have to disclose a breach within a stipulated time frame. And I think in the public company segment, it's somewhere between 48 to 72 hours. And this time around that, if that is applicable to private companies, it's gonna be you know a game changer in terms of how private companies, especially most of them are PE backed, are going to take a look at cybersecurity. Um, so naturally everyone is looking into uh, you know, cyber resiliency, there is an increased impetus in, in establishing the cyber controls. And um, uh, one of the one of the key ways to establish the controls is through zero trust, which you're fully aware of. And when it comes to adoption of this or implementation of zero trust among PE firms and their portfolio companies, um, uh, I would just answering your other parts of the question now, which is, um, now, what I've seen work well is these organizations that are willing to bypass the legacy mindset are able to leapfrog into zero trust. So I'll give you a classic example. I mean, you know, uh, when um, uh, US was pretty far behind in mob mobile phone adoption, while some of the developing countries were catching up pretty quickly. And why was that? Why was that? Because you know, the landline infrastructure was so strong in the U.S. that um, they were able to, you know, uh, able to kind of utilize that to their advantage and that there was not need for mobile phone adoption um, as much, right? So, but in the developing countries, they thought that this is a leapfrog uh, approach that they could take and they just skipped landlines and they moved straight away to cell phone adoption. And that's why I think you see in yep. your country. India and China that, that have come together. So this is an opportunity, you know? So if, when they acquire companies, the portfolio companies, which are the legacy mindset, this is an opportunity to get them to zero trust. And um, this, this ruling is pretty welcome, by, by the way, right? Like it's not taken as a burden, but it's a welcome um, ruling that we are looking to, you know, utilize to the advantage of um, the private equity firms, their portfolio companies, and also the entire ecosystem. And we'll all be watching how that plays out in the months to come and the implications on, on boards and their companies. So now that you've laid out the zero trust uh, value prop, let's dive into some of the specifics. You mentioned earlier that six of the top 10 PE firms are Zscaler customers. Now a great time to illustrate, you know, any recent success stories around zero, the zero trust journey. Uh, from recent implementations. Do any come to mind that you could talk about? Yep, absolutely. So I think, I mean, again, from the firms that are our customers, they, they definitely are uh, very, very happy customers and they would like to uh, kind of share their happiness with other customers as well. Because uh, most of the PE firms, if we think about them as our customers are uh, smaller from um, a number of resources perspective. There are some large ones who have like 5,000 to 8,000 um, uh, employees, but uh, most of the PE firms are somewhere around, you know, 
anywhere from 200 people to uh, 2000 people right so uh, so we have a pretty happy set of customers there um, and uh, while the volume of users is not that heavy uh, they are definitely dealing with a lot of sensitive information but uh, when it comes to success stories, I would like to highlight more from the portfolio side, uh, because that would be very, very relevant for the audience. Um, and I'll share a recent success story at a portfolio company and one that involved a PE firm itself, for sure, right? Like, but uh, let's start with the portfolio company success story first. So uh, recently, we helped uh, a portfolio company of a large PE house, um, and uh, that is a provider of uh, traffic management services. And you think about these orange cones that go for traffic diversions and those barricades that are put in place when there's a construction going on or some landslide happen, et cetera, et cetera. So that company specializes in driving some of that, and, and it's, a, it's a market leader in that space. And um, we got a referral from the PE firm uh, cyber advisory team, and they wanted to share that they found some gaps in their security assessment while they were doing their security assessment for their portfolio company. And I said, a lot of progressive firms are already ahead of the curve and they're taking a look at their portfolio companies doing the assessment. So that was the result of one such assessment that came out. They found the gaps in security in users accessing internet and applications from remote locations. They also found that there are a lot of legacy tools in the mix at that portfolio company. And lastly, they uh, they were um, um, getting this feedback that the users are not very happy. There's a poor user experience from their VPN per se. So, um, so and then we when we kind of started to talk to them and um, they realized that uh, their owner has a pretty strong partnership with Zscaler. Uh, they have an existing partnership um, and uh, they get preferred terms uh, from us. And um, um, they have, um, I mean, Zscaler specializes in the M&A use case as well because the, that particular portfolio company grew through acquisitions. And, and finally, I mean, not the least, I mean, it's no surprise, um, uh, we are a Gartner Magic Quadrant leader for a decade plus now, and, um, and that uh, provides a lot of credibility as well. And I would just like to share the outcome as well, because that is really powerful. We, in, um, in like 30 to 45 days, um, the company was really convinced that this is the right solution. And we were able to up-level the security posture, consolidate their legacy tools, and then uh, finally accelerate their M&A integration. So what, can, what more can you ask for, Chris? And I am happy to share <laughs> the PE firm story as well, but the portfolio company itself is, um, is, uh, is really a happy customer now excellent and that is a great place to to wrap up this episode Akshay went over the pe market overview talked about the different types of transaction archetypes we looked at it through the lens of m a overall folded in the zero trust architecture with uh, the board perspective before going through some example customers Akshay, anything else you want to leave our listeners with? I would just say that, you know, zero trust is a journey. Um, and when you are looking to get on that journey, uh, be patient with yourself and do not uh, think about it as a daunting activity. It's a, it's a journey and you have to take one step at a time. So I would say uh, start somewhere, uh, but start um, start now so you are able to can take the journey successfully and um, um, you know Zscaler has done this um, hundreds of thousands of times um, and it's really important to have a great partner who brings in a platform approach uh, to drive such a, uh, such an um, such an exciting journey for secure digital transformation that companies would like to get on I could not have said it better myself to learn more about how Zscaler M&A and divestitures capabilities can help PE firms and leaders boost their cyber resiliency as well as their portfolio companies and improve the speed and value of transactions. Where uh, where should uh, our listeners head over to? We have a dedicated page out there uh, on private equity, uh, and uh, that would be an excellent place to start. And of course, um, uh, Chris, uh, with this uh, podcast, uh, you know, you're happy to connect with anybody who is 
wanting to learn more about the solution and um, and how it could benefit not only the firms but also their portfolio companies and the transactions i'm always available excellent we've been listening to akshay grover private equity practice lead at zscaler and if you come to zenith live in las vegas next month you may be able to meet him and ask him some questions face to face Absolutely. Already booked my tickets and uh, excited to be there in Vegas um, this year as well. Brilliant. Thank you, everybody, for listening. And thank you, Akshay, for joining us today. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for listening to the CIO Evolution. Check back with your podcast provider regularly for more episodes. You can find more episodes along with other podcasts on the CXO Revolutionaries website at revolutionaries.zscaler.com. Statements by Zscaler podcasters and guests are informational only and should never be construed as legal advice. You should consult your legal advisor on matters related to you or your business. Zscaler makes no warranties, express, implied, or statutory as to the content of this podcast, and it is provided as is. Content on this podcast may contain forward-looking statements that are current as of the date of the recording and subject to change. These statements are subject to the safe harbor provisions created by the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. Full legal disclaimers are available at revolutionaries.zscaler.com. Copyright 2021.